Then I said, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go and tell this people, Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull, and their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and return and be healed. Thank you, brother, so much for uh, reading that. And here we are in Isaiah chapter 6, and we're going to be studying that passage together this morning. And I want you to think about times in your life when you have had to be the bearer of bad news. Maybe you have uh, had to bring some kind of news to maybe a, an authority figure or a boss of yours, and you know that that news is not going to be received very well. You are quite aware that the response that you're going to uh, be served back to you is going to be one that is negative and one that is harsh, and you are going to be met with displeasure. And potentially even there are certain cases where you are aware that you yourself may even be disciplined because of the news that you're bringing forth. You may not have been involved in the creation of the news. You may not have even had anything to do with the actual context of what it is that's being discussed. But because you are the message bearer, because you are meeting someone who was expecting maybe one thing or uh, sees the world and perceives the world in a certain way, you are going to be bringing something that is contrary to that and therefore are going to be met with resistance and are going to be met uh, in an unpleasant manner. Well, here we see in Isaiah chapter 6 that Isaiah was, was faced with something uh, very similar. He was going to have to provide uh, teaching, instruction, correction to the people of Israel, and God is telling Isaiah from the get-go, hey, uh, this isn't going to work out where they're jumping up and down and excited by what it is you're providing to them, but rather it's going to further uh, embolden them in their current state. And so we're going to look and see at what Isaiah was dealing with here in Isaiah chapter 6. We're also going to consider how this translates in various passages that we find in the New Testament concerning this type of instruction and this type of approach that God's people had to take. And then we're also going to make application to our own lives in certain types of situations where we may find ourselves in a similar spot to that of Isaiah and also consider and evaluate other uh, contexts and areas where it doesn't directly apply and how we can evaluate appropriately between the two. And so let's begin by noticing our points this morning. Verse 8, we're going to study there and see that God was searching. God was searching. Also in verse 8, you see at the end there, Isaiah was submitting. Isaiah was submitting. Verse 9, God was sending. God was sending. And finally in verse 10, Isaiah was showing. Isaiah was showing. Let's begin there, verse 8 together, in Isaiah chapter 6. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? What is the context of God's people in this passage? Well, if you look in the previous chapters in Isaiah, notice with me, for example, in Isaiah chapter 1, Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 15. And when ye spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when ye make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. God's people had reached the point where they thought by simply going through the motions and basically acting and playing the part of a servant of God, that they therefore were acceptable in his sight. Meanwhile, they're living a life that is quite contrary to the attempts to approach God in prayer and their attempts to look or appeal holy. So they're living a life which is, which is defined as murderous. They're living a life which is wicked while at the same time trying to claim and uh, get this idea that God would accept and would hear their prayer. God's describing and explaining here quite plainly to them that he is not going to hear them. Although they're praying to him, although they're reaching out forth toward him, he's not willing to listen. We see in Proverbs chapter 28 and in verse 9, he that turneth away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be abomination. If I'm not willing to listen to what God has to say, if I'm not willing to do what God has commanded and required of me, then how can I expect that God is going to hear and be mindful of the prayers and the requests that I'm casting before him? But rather, if I am searching and seeking and longing to be right with the Lord, 
and diligent in my effort to understand what it is that he requires of me while praying to him in the process of such a search. <laughs> yes, indeed, God hears my prayer. God is aware of my efforts to be acceptable and uh, to be living a life that is pleasing in his sight. Uh, we see in Matthew chapter 7, beginning there in verse 7, Jesus is explaining in the Sermon on the Mount regarding the searching that we can all engage in, the fact that we can indeed receive that uh, which we are searching for. Matthew 7 and verse 7, Ask and it shall be given you, seek and ye shall find, and knock and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh Find it, and to him that knock it, it shall be opened. Folks, if I'm trying to be right with God, if my aim is to please him, then in the process of seeking such a life, my prayers are then heard by God so that I can then find what it is I need to find in order to glorify him. However, if I then am presented with the truth, if I then find what it is that I need to do in order to be right with him, and then I reject it, and I say, you know what, I, I understand, God, I'm searching, and I want to be right with you, but I don't want to do things your way. I realize you command me to do this, and you uh, require me to do that, but, you know, that's too hard for me. I'm going to avoid that. I'm going to plug up my ears. I don't want to hear it any longer, but continue to hear my prayers. No, it doesn't work that way. It does not work that way. And God's people here in the time of Isaiah, they were living a double life. They were aware of what God had required of them. Of, of them. They were no longer searching to please him. They were no longer searching to glorify him. And so God, therefore, is no longer hearing their requests. Isaiah chapter 5, we also see that they were living a life that could in many ways be similar to in the way in which we define our culture today. Isaiah 5 and verse 20. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil. That put darkness for light and light for darkness. That put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. In other words, uh, a, a group of folks that literally have become insane. They continue to do the same things over and over and over again expecting a different result. If I just call that which is evil good... If I just call that which is dark light and I continue to try to exalt and esteem those kinds of lifestyles, then eventually I'm going to get what I want and they just continuously find themselves at odds with the Lord. In many ways, folks, we can, uh, I think, see many parallels to our society today. And that's why, in many respects, what God is commanding Isaiah here is interesting to us because in certain respects, we face very similar types of mindsets, mental models that existed by those in the day of Isaiah. God was searching for someone to go out and correct this people. He was searching for someone to go out and be bold in declaring God's word so that they would have no questions regarding what God expected of them. Folks, God wants people to be saved. God doesn't want people to be lost. God doesn't want people to choose to go to hell. He wants them to go to heaven, and therefore he's granted by his graciousness the avenue and opportunity to obtain such through the graciousness of his son, Jesus Christ. Paul explains to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 2, and in verse 4, regarding God our Savior, he will have all men to be saved and to come unto uh, know, the knowledge of the truth. God wants all men to be saved. He wants all men to come uh, to a recognition and understanding of God's will, the truth. Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. Luke chapter 19 and verse 10. God is still, just as he was back there in Isaiah chapter 6, searching. He's looking for those who will do his bidding, who will be his messenger. And we see then as well in Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 8 that Isaiah was submitting. God was searching, but Isaiah was submitting himself. In other words, he was putting his name forward to be someone who would go out and do the work and the service of God. Here am I, send me. Here am I, send me. We likewise understand that in the first century, there were those 
who were willing to do the same. Jesus understood that he only had a limited time whereby he was able to do the work of God. He explains in John chapter 9 and in verse 4, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. Jesus understood the will of his father. He understood the mission, the task that he had before him. He also was well aware of the resistance and the persecution that he was facing currently and that he was going to face in going to the cross. But yet he was willing and understood the need to submit himself and his life to the will of God. Paul was very similar. Notice with me in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and in verse 16 Paul states there, for though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me, yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. We just sang a song a few minutes ago. Will you not tell it today? Paul lived that song. He understood that it was required by him because of the knowledge that he had, because of the abilities that he had in order for God to be glorified, to lay out before men the instructions and the requirements that God expected for mankind to fulfill in order to be right with him. Paul didn't view preaching the gospel as something that was a chore. He didn't view preaching the gospel as something that he should be afraid or should shun at, rather he viewed it as an obligation. Folks, let me ask you a question. If you were walking in downtown Atlanta, and it was a pretty empty street, weren't a whole lot of folks out, middle of the day, and you were strong physically, capable physically. And as you were walking down the street, you looked across the way. And on the sidewalk on the other side of the street, there was a, a young little girl, maybe about five, six, seven years old, and was screaming and crying as she is being physically overpowered by a weaker fellow than yourself. You were capable of being able, able to overpower that individual. What, what would you do? Would, would you just turn your head? Maybe just look the other direction? Try to just forget about it, round the corner as soon as you could? Take off and just say, I don't want to think about that again. Would you stop, look at that person and say, hey, that's wrong, and then just keep going? What would you do? I think we all know what the right answer is. I think we all understand that we would be obligated in that situation, given what it was that we were capable of doing. Given the weakness and the lack of ability by the one that is being abused and being overtaken to fight and fend for themselves, that we had a responsibility in order to uphold and maintain our integrity to step in, intervene, and get involved. Physically speaking, we can understand that. But sometimes when it comes to spirituality, we don't quite see it that way. We don't see the world and their state of being lost without hope, on their way to hell, not having obeyed the gospel. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, 7 through 9. This isn't just the preacher saying the lost is going to hell. This isn't just the preacher saying folks that haven't obeyed the gospel are going to hell. That's what God has said. 
Folks in such a state being overpowered, being controlled, being abused by Satan. One that is weak. One that has taken already a blow, as we understand in Hebrews chapter 2. Because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, just as God had explained all the way back in Genesis chapter 3, would take place through the seed of woman. A child of God is aligned with he who has overcome the world. A child of God is one who is powerful, not because of his or her own self, but because of Jesus Christ. The knowledge, the capability, the strength, the liberating ability that we have as God's people. Does it not require and demand in order for us to maintain our integrity, to step in and intervene when we see one that is lost, that is being overpowered by the works of Satan? Well, folks, that's how Paul, the apostle, saw it. Paul said preaching the gospel isn't an option. It's a necessity. I understand what it does. I know what it did for me. And I know what it can do for the world. And I have to teach it. I have to. Paul was willing to put himself forward. Paul was willing, just as Jesus was willing, to do the work of God. And folks, when we think about the parable of the sower, for example, we understand that a lot of our work, it's not going to result in folks immediately jumping up and saying, hey, I'm ready to give up my life and I'm ready to live for Jesus Christ. I'm ready to give up my own will and do what God says. God's made it plain to us, folks. That's not how people are going to respond. Luke chapter 8, beginning there in verse 10, Jesus is explaining here the parable of the sower. Unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to others in parables that seeing they might not see, and hearing they might not understand. Now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are they that hear, then cometh the devil, and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. They on the rock are they which, when they hear, receive the word with joy. And these have no root, which for a while believe, and in time of temptation fall away. And that which fell among thorns are they which, when they have heard, go forth, and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life, and bring no fruit to perfection. But that on the good ground are they which, in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it and bring forth fruit with patience. Now, folks, if you notice here in this parable... Each outcome is after the sower has sown seed. Sometimes what we do is we say, well, you know what? If I sow the seed to this individual, I know they're going to respond this way. How do we know that? Do we really know that? Are we not then choosing for that person whether or not they want to be set free from the abuse of Satan? That's like saying, I don't want to cross the street and go and defend that young child that's being abused because that child wants to be abused. And I'm choosing that for that child. Paul understood it as an obligation. Jesus understood that he had a limited time to do the work of God. Do we understand that we are responsible for sowing the seed throughout this world? So that the truth might land on the hearts of the lost. And folks, when we're doing it, when we're going out, when we're teaching, when we're preaching, when we're living lives convicted and faithful with allegiance to the gospel, we're not doing it by ourselves. God doesn't say go out and, and do this and, you know, immediately when you start engaging and teaching and preaching and evangelizing, I, I'm not there anymore. All that strength that you had, as soon as you cross the street, I stay on the other side. God doesn't say that. God's right there with us. Paul explains in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, beginning there in uh, verse 5, Who then is Paul and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom he believed, even as the Lord gave to every man? I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. 
So that neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor, for we are laborers together with God. Paul says we are working in tandem, we are working in unison with God. He is the one that is actually doing the work. We are just simply the messengers and the servants doing his bidding. We used to sing a song, the battle belongs to the Lord. I think sometimes that's one of those songs like Jesus loves me that we kind of segment and say, well, that's just a youth, that's just a child song. Folks, we need to hear that song as adults. The preaching and teaching and spreading of the gospel. The Lord is the one that owns that battle. Are we willing to submit ourselves and submit our names and put forth our labor and work to carry it out? Isaiah was. But notice as well in Isaiah chapter 6, God was sending. God was searching verse 8. Isaiah was submitting verse 8, verse 9. God was sending. God says to Isaiah, Go and tell this people, Hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see ye indeed, but perceive not. Folks, these are a people who are well aware of they understand what God had required of them and they had left and had thought that somehow they could still be right with the Lord while completely avoiding his commandments. Isaiah is in a different environment than we are in today and we have to make a distinction as to who it is that we are dealing with and interacting with as we begin to engage in our efforts to study. Jude explains in Jude 22 that on some we are to have compassion making a difference. But then he says in verse 23, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Jesus does this very plainly in Matthew chapter 23 regarding those that are in power, the Pharisees and the scribes and the Jewish leaders. He states over and over again in this context that those scribes and Pharisees are hypocrites. Verse 13 Verse 14, verse 15. Notice as well, verses 23 through 26 specifically. He calls them out plainly and clearly, does not hold back. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought ye have to have done, and not to leave the other undone. Ye blind guides which strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you may clean the outside of the cup of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisee, clean first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Now, folks, when Jesus was speaking to the common man, he was not approaching them with this same type of tone and this same type of language. As a matter of fact, we call it the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5 through chapter 7. The common people have come and surrounded themselves by Jesus. We see plain teaching and instruction. He doesn't hold back regarding what's required of them, but he also does not deride them and chide them concerning their hypocrisy. And we notice at the end there of the Sermon on the Mount that the people were astonished at his doctrine. Verse 28, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. In other words, they were thankful they were very much willing to be taught and to be trained. They had the minds of a child and were hungry for the truth. Jesus uses a different approach and a different type of language and interaction with them. But when it comes to leadership, we see in Matthew chapter 23 that Jesus doesn't hold back and is very, very clear regarding their state. Look as well at Paul's response to what was at least being called at that time the high priest Ananias, which is another study altogether as to whether or not he was actually physically the high priest. Obviously at this time he was not spiritually the high priest. Jesus Christ was, Hebrews chapter 4. And so Paul is either dealing with the fact that he's not really the high priest because of Hebrews chapter 4, or he is pretending to be the high priest or is being called the high priest secularly from the Jewish ecosystem. But notice here in, in Acts chapter 23, the language that Paul uses 
Verse 2, And the high priest Ananias commanded them that stood by to smite him on the mount. Well, Paul had just said in verse 1, Hey, there was a time when I was living in good conscience. There was a time when I thought I was right with God because I was living by the Jewish law, but I realized that I was not right with God. My conscience was clear. Folks, that's in many ways a lot of how uh, folks guide themselves today regarding their spirituality and whether or not they're right with the Lord. Hey, I have a clear conscience, so I'm right with God. That's how Paul was thinking at one time. Then he learned, hey, you know what? I'm living the wrong way. I'm not actually obeying God. And so Ananias commands that Paul is to be smitten on the mouth. Paul responds in verse 3, God shall smite thee, thou whited wall, for sittest thou to judge me after the law and commandest me to be smitten contrary to the law. Paul calls him out. It's very clear here. And when we think about the ways in which we are to speak truth to power, there's some instruction that we see, as Paul made clear there in that context, as well as, obviously, the authority of Christ in Matthew chapter 23. Just like the battle belongs to the Lord regarding the courage that we need to gin up and even engaging in confrontational discussions in our efforts to evangelize, likewise, the battle belongs to the Lord when we are defending the truth clearly and plainly in that interaction. Jude explains this in verse 9. He says, Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. Now who's he engaging with here? Satan. He's the archangel. In this interaction, but he does not claim to own of his own self the justification for rebuking Satan. But rather, gives the Lord the credit and as being the source for the rebuke. Folks, when we rebuke power, when we go off and are sent and are in a situation where maybe we're being asked questions and uh, this happens commonly in, in my life, and I'm sure with the elders as well. Uh, folks like to try to justify themselves. They come and they ask questions and they begin to interact, and, and really they're trying to figure out a way to get out of you what they want to hear and maintain their own life. And you know that you're going to be running into, pretty quickly, a uh, confrontation. And it can be difficult. But we see here that the response is not, hey, look, I'm going to tell you how it is, and you're going to listen to what I have to say. Rather, the response is, well, the Lord teaches this. The Bible says this. <coughs> and when folks ask us those kinds of questions where we know the message and the response that we're going to be delivering unto them is not going to be well received, the answer should be, well, let me tell you what the Bible says. Let me tell you what God says. Isaiah had submitted himself and God was sending him. And finally, Isaiah was showing. Showing by the response of this people where they really stood. Verse 10 there in Isaiah chapter 6, Make the heart of this people fat and make their ears heavy. And shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and convert. And be healed. Let me ask you a question. Does God really not want these people to hear? I mean, we read 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 4 a few moments ago. What does God want out of the lost? He wants them to be saved. Does God actually not want these people to hear and understand? No. But what does God also know? He knows how they're going to respond. He knows that they're going to plug their ears. He knows that they don't want to understand. He knows that they have hard, fattened hearts. In other words, they're happy and content in their own lost state, and they don't want to change. But God doesn't say, well, Isaiah, because of this, you're not to be going and teaching them. God doesn't say, just avoid them altogether because of their state. 
but rather expose that state, show that state, bring to light the state that they are in because of the way in which they respond by the teaching, the preaching, the evangelizing Isaiah that you're going to be doing. Folks, the same is true with us. The same is true with us. Sometimes we avoid a confrontational and a difficult response. We avoid even sowing the seed as we see commanded there in Luke chapter 8. We avoid even having the conversation with individuals because we know that it's going to yield controversy and that we're not going to be very liked and they're not going to want to be our friends any longer. And sometimes we think, well, because that's going to be the outcome, surely this is something I just need to avoid altogether. And although they're maybe asking me some questions, and although I know they don't want to hear the answer, the true answer to these questions, I'm just going to avoid it. I'm just going to stay away. I'm just going to run. Well, folks, sometimes the objective is not necessarily that they obey and do what God says. Sometimes the objective is just to plainly expose via the gospel the stubbornness, the rebellion, their refusal to submit unto God. And then they can never say, well, no one ever told me. No, you've had the opportunity. You've had the gospel. Good morning. Now, are you here this morning stubbornly, rebelliously, Cleaving to your own idea of how spirituality works. If you are, don't allow the outcome of hearing the gospel and having the seed planted on your heart to be, I'm not going to allow it to sink in. You have the